Thank you for that, it's good. Yeah. Yeah. Well, I love the lovely. I know y'all are here to see me, so without further ado, the Masked Man Show, hosted by Khan and Dan Schumacher. Good morning, y'all. I got real up feeling good. Third day. Fanatics Fest, been enjoying it. Yeah. Seeing some great people so far. Good time, having fun. Yeah, I'm having fun. Having a great time? It's a good place. Okay, okay. How many of y'all were here yesterday? Y'all here yesterday? Yeah! Alright, alright. Had some fun with CM Punk yesterday? Yeah! Okay, okay. He had a lot of things to say yesterday, alright? And we figured it was only fair that the person that he had a lot of things to say about would have, I guess, a little bit of a rebuttal. Equal time, yeah. Equal time. Like, you know, it's an election year, equal time, equal press, all that type of stuff. So, Dave, would you like to do the honors? Without further ado, the living legend, Drew McIntyre. <laughs> to be not PG without the mic, so it's all good. Guys, make some noise for Drew McIntyre, people. Yeah. Hope you're all having an incredible morning. Uh, Drew, you've had an incredible year so far. And arguably, one of the biggest moments of the year was when you finally got to get your hands on our guest yesterday, CM Punk at SummerSlam. Beat him right in the middle of the ring. One, two, three. And the dude that you also hate had to count the one, two, three. So I bet that felt awesome. So the question I have for you is, was the six to seven month wait to get your hands on CM Punk worth it at SummerSlam? I mean, I guess uh, rather would have done it sooner and finish my mission again, Punk, out of WWE. But the problem with Punk is he is the exact opposite of Wolverine. He got this little arm injury that would take any other human being about three months to recover from, or me two months to recover from, since he's got no recovery powers, no recuperating powers. It took seven freaking months for him to finally come back. Me to be um, prove to him I'm actually the best in the world now. In the ring, clearly. Much bigger, more handsome than him. On this microphone these days, because PG Punk ain't quite the punk of all, and certainly on social media, I beat him in every single way. Heard that answer he gave you yesterday. Yo, what was so the we got yesterday? It was, uh, it was going viral. So we, we, we had a combo with him yesterday, and obviously we know you and Punk do not get along, so I challenged him, I was like, yo, says one thing nice about Drew McIntyre. And he said, you are the fourth best WWE wrestler to wear a kilt behind Roddy Roddy Piper and the Highlander. So Drew, I'm gonna ask you the same question. I'm gonna challenge you to say one nice thing about CM Punk. I can actually do that because I always tell the truth and I'm not a hypocrite unlike Punk in that answer yesterday was just lazy like say something nice he's the fourth best wrestler he's worse than the highlanders i mean that's just not true it's just silly it's just lazy like he one nice thing about punk he sells a lot of t-shirts that's true he's that great. true yeah for mer merchandising he's a big name the thing it proves that i'm the best in the world and that's what i've done i'm a professional wrestler day in day out he went away he'd been living on this pipe bomb for years, living on the feud with Cena, he was smart, he maximized, he became a big star, but nostalgia is a hell of a thing. 
He's been gone for all this time. His legend's been created. He's no longer a professional wrestler. He's an attraction. There's nothing wrong with being an attraction. We need attractions, but don't fucking say you're a professional wrestler if you're not a professional wrestler. I'm a professional wrestler. Well, talk a little bit more. Actually, you know what? I'm gonna stay on Twitter for a minute. I popped on Twitter this morning, and I saw the, I saw Kaz's tweet that you had retweeted, and he responded to it, and I said, I didn't realize it was you at first. I said, why is Kaz responding to these Twitter? How much time do you spend on Twitter every day, and how much, and how important to you presence going? And I really don't spend that much time on Twitter or social media, especially when I'm home, because my wife would kill me. She allows me to keep kind of balance in, in my life. But no, that what you see on Twitter, what you hear in the microphone, what you're seeing right now, that's just me. Like, I'm from the UK, I'm British, we have a different sense of humor. It's half the time that's how I talk to my friends, but if I genuinely don't like somebody, I'll shred them on there, and some people will get upset, and they'll call me a troll. The reality is, it's just because they're not good enough to go back and forth on there. And I'm not your average troll, I've said it before. I will tear you apart on social media, then I'll step behind this uh, social media. I'm 6 foot 5, 280. After ripping you apart on there, I'll beat your ass. And I've said it before, if I wasn't married, I'd take your girl too. That's the kind of troll I am. I'm a beast in every way. Drew, you, you mentioned that, you know, after you got fired, you came back to reinvent yourself and show people you're the best in the world. And obviously your return to WWE was great. But I, I'd argue that this past year, your growth, we all know you were an incredible wrestler, but this personality that we get to see more of, like, I don't know if it was hidden or you just had to be. So I guess my question is, when did you know that, like, okay, I got all these other things. I got to get this last infinity stone of connecting with people through this medium that has worked so well for so many other people. I think it's the environment kind of we're in now, the creative environment with WWE, um, uh, the Triple H kind of leading the charge. There's this freedom that feels like I've never felt before the whole time I've been in WWE to truly go all the way. Not that I didn't feel like I went a lot of the way in the past, but to truly go all the way now and you see so many different people, guys and girls across the board, finding themselves. And we've got so many superstars now, the show doesn't revolve around the same two or three people. As much as it was nice to be in 15 segments in one show, we need a lot more stars. And across the board we have so many people now. and. There was a time where I felt like I was going all the way, but I wasn't. And I woke up one morning and I decided, I'll use the analogy, if anyone's ever seen the Howard Stern movie, Private Parts, but Howard's talking to his wife, and he's been shocking up to that point. He said, you know, I feel like I'm not going all the way, and I said, I'm going to take the, the filters off, I'm going to go all in now, like all or nothing, and I don't care the repercussions. And she was like, you've not been going all the way. I was like, no, I haven't. And that's where I started the mindset of, I care, but I don't care. I'm going to do exactly what I think, what I want, when I want. And if people don't like it, then screw them. But as long as the fans are cheering, as long as they're, you know, booing, as long as they're emotionally invested, I don't give a damn what anybody thinks, including the guys on the roster. They can suck it. We're trying to make you guys care. And that's what it's all about now. And I feel... Like I'm truly my 100% self. When I was world champion, when I was leading the charge or during the pandemic and afterwards, I felt it was a certain line I hit. No matter what happened, I had to keep that big stupid smile in my face. And I find it interesting watching someone like Punk yesterday up on stage. And it's almost like we've switched roles. When he was younger, he was what was different on the show. He spoke his mind. He felt like a rebel. He felt dangerous. And now he's just this suit wearing corporate guy, the corporate man punk I call him. It seems like he's scared, he toes the company line, he doesn't want to say anything too controversial. The older he's gotten, exactly PG Punk. And that feels like the real person, that feels like who he is. And myself, when I was younger, I felt like I had to try and be that Cena type. He's also been ducking me for a match forever, never the one-on-one -on -one match. I'm sure his last run, he'll still duck me again. But I always tried to be that Cena type and put that smile on and, you know, I gotta do this, I gotta do this. And I'm happy to do all the things that I did, especially the charity work, I'm Global Ambassador of Special Olympics. Those mean a lot to me, but it still wasn't me. 
when I fully let go now, I see Punk as this corporate guy in this suit, and I see myself as the rebel, and hopefully the dangerous guy. I know people get uneasy when I'm on social media and checking my messages. People get uneasy when they're in the ring with me because I'll kick the shit out of you. People get uneasy when I've got a microphone like right now because I literally don't care. What's the worst thing that can happen? I get fired, I get suspended, I get fired. As long as I do it in my merit, I don't care. As long as I'm the one that made the decision, I was truly myself. I don't care the repercussions these days. All that matters is I make you guys feel something. Dave, before you ask that question, before we continue, now I'm so glad you said that because Drew, anybody who's watched you over the years has been told this about you, said this about you, but I think it's official. Um, we're here to give you a gift. And for the past year, you have been on this man's ass every single day. So guys, for the first time ever, we are awarding Drew McIntyre International Hater of the Year with this very special hat. <laughs> Made by Lance, <Lynch. laughs> right down there. We'd love for you to put that on when you get a chance. <laughs> yes. This is very special. Go, go. <laughs> go get your lids uh, customized hats over there. Uh, I don't know if it's hater, but I appreciate it. It's a very nice hat. It's just truth teller. Like, you know, that's my thing. Like, even some of the guys, especially the punks of the hey, world, they lie, they're hypocrites, they try to say the right thing. All I've ever done is tell the truth. And sometimes people don't like it and they say, you're the bad guy now. And I tell them, how am I the bad guy? And once they give me their opinion, I explain my opinion, it suddenly sways them. I've always said, my degree's in criminology, I actually went to college, I like punk. <clears throat> so my degree's in criminology, and in the criminal justice system, all you have to do to prove somebody's guilty beyond reasonable doubt is, you know, present your evidence, the jury look at it, they go, okay, he's guilty beyond reasonable doubt. If you take 10 minutes, go on the internet, Look down character testimonies about me. I've always been known as a nice guy, working hard, give everything to this industry. And then character testimonies and stories about punk. It's not a case of he's guilty beyond reasonable doubt and I'm right and I'm telling the truth. He should be getting the chair and there's so much evidence against them. I'm alive. Stop me when I tell lies. I'm not going to stop you. I'm not going to stop you. <laughs> Go ahead, Dave. When you're not having big time matches, uh, over the past year, like little headspace, like when you go out with a microphone in your hand, compared to the way you go out for a big match. Pretty similar. You know, excited. I still get butterflies. Um, I think I'll always get those. You know, the day I stop getting butterflies or nervous energy is the day I retire. But um, it depends on the situation as well. You know, these days if I've got, you know, the mic in my hand, um, I know a rough idea of what's going to be said, I know what story we're trying to tell, but at the same time, I'm going to say whatever comes to me, and sometimes if I do in the match, move-wise, is not going to get me a slap in the wrist, but sometimes the things that come out of my mouth during interviews are what happened and what felt natural in the moment, and a lot of the time, my go-to is a uh, kind of sick sense of humor or saying something up. Wrist was slapped, but that's how I operate. Yeah, I don't think what the reporting was, but uh, free Was it on the internet? It was on the internet, so you know it was oh, true. It's gotta be true. But um, you, you had a, a choice, right? Like, uh, free agency was coming up. You decided to resign, and uh, when you resigned, you posted a video on Instagram with a uh, special gift from The Rock. And um, talk to me about what that gift meant to you. Uh, once you signed the contract, remained in WWE, and the connection that you and The Rock had when he gave you that, that very special gift. Yeah, I mean, that whole time period was so surreal. Um, I've talked about it publicly, so I'm not saying anything. I haven't spoke about it before, but there was a time where I was planning to take a break from WWE. I've never had a vacation in my life, unlike Punk, I didn't take nine years off. I've never had time off. I was signed to WWE from university when I was 21 years old. Was debuting on TV when I was 22. Got fired at 28. Was busier than I've ever been for three years in the independents. Came back um, to the company and then that's when I started rising up the ranks. And uh, fortunately, you know, a year and a half ago, my wife lost her sister. And that was the time where I said, you know what, I gotta take some time off for the first time ever. Not just for me, but for my family. And, you know, can I be present? And uh, 
I knew that months and months in advance of the contract and I was like no matter what I gotta take this time off and as time passed you know time heals wounds it's never the same but they started dealing with things a little better things on TV started kicking off and the character got so hot you know we had a conversation as a family and my wife basically said you can't leave the table when you're on a heater so we've got to figure this out and you know Triple H and Nick Khan were awesome making sure the contract and my future worked not just for the company but for my family and then to figure it out with them and cap it off with The Rock you know sending one of my claymores which will be displayed in my office wall with a nice note and he's been so awesome with advice um, and being there you know when I need him was just so surreal because it was 10 years from basically the day when I re-signed that I got fired and to think about that 10 years of hey like you have to leave home now bugger off and I go either find yourself or leave wrestling and to know the work I put in and 10 years later I'm able to negotiate with the top top guys in WWE Nick Khan Triple H for the best deal for everybody the rocks and the sword is so surreal and I tell everyone out there I'm always especially kids when it comes to chasing your dreams and the likes you know, I'm from a small town in Scotland, like nobody was ever signed directly from Scotland to WWE at the time, and I said I was going to do it. People said, you're freaking crazy, it's an American thing, there's five million people, why are you the one that's going to do it? And I was relentless, and I also stuck in at school, and I tell the kids, stick in at school, get your education, but chase those dreams with, you know, the blinders on, don't listen to the negativity, just keep pushing forward, you'll achieve them, so I've achieved them, then I've lost them, had to find myself and re-achieve them and after getting fired 10 years later get the contract, get the gift from The Rock uh, you really can make your dreams come true again and again and again so whatever it is, it's never too late not just the kids out there like leave, no, leave no stone unturned and be accountable to the person in the mirror and as much as it's uh, funny for me to say don't listen to the negativity on social media <laughs> it's not real but if you come for me, I'll rip you to fucking shreds on there. <laughs> Listen, yes, be, your relentlessness is on the record. I mean, the way that you've made your comeback and turned yourself, transformed yourself into the rest of today, it's shocking. But looking back, do you, is there any part of yourself that you could imagine what you would have been doing if it weren't being a WWE superstar? No. Um... I was always going to be a wrestler no matter what. I mean, if I wasn't in WWE, I'd be wrestling an independent level. Um, I went to school because they basically gave me, you know, I went to further my education and finish, and my dad really wanted that, but they also gave me a student loan, which I used for supplements to feed my wrestling <laughs> As I was getting my education, no matter what, it was going to be wrestling. And, you know, my degrees in criminology, I was interested in some weird stuff when I was a kid. Maybe some kind of special agent, but I would be a wrestler no matter what. And yeah, I'm very lucky just the way things have worked out. And it's been a while, 24 years I've been wrestling now, but everyone's always shocked to find out. I'm still in my 30s, by the way. Everyone always says that guys like you and, you know, AJ and Seamus loves when I mention how old he is. Um, and I have to remind them, hey, those guys are mid-40s, still in 30s over here, so still plenty of years of Drew McIntyre to go. <laughs> Drew, you're the, you're the greatest wrestler to come out of Scotland in history, so with that being said, I have one question for you. And the UK. I'm the only British in the UK, ever, but it's, it's a very specific question. Do you believe in Joe Hendry? <laughs> I do believe in Joe Hendry. Yeah. I've known Joe forever. It's amazing just to see you know, him catch on now. People are like, oh, that new wrestler, Joe Hendry, he's cool. He's not a new wrestler. He's put in his time. He's paid his dues. And it's awesome to see hard work actually paying off. And he deserves all the success that he gets. He made a video about me years ago. If you look up, uh, I'm Drew to the tune of I'm Blue. It's on uh, social media, like he made a song about me and he deserves that success. He's earned the right to get what he's getting right now. It's not like he took nine years off, came back, and tried to leapfrog the whole roster to get made a better WrestleMania. <laughs> like I was gonna let that happen. You are, you are really a hater, that's what I want you to know. <laughs> truth teller. You're a truth teller, whatever. You're a truth teller, hater. Any case, um, Seth Rollins. 
We had a World Underwear Championship match. Uh, yeah, make some noise for Seth Rollins. <laughs> when you say you're a truth teller, I think that robbery probably speaks the most to it, right? Because even though we have both had goals of being World Heavyweight Champion and leading the company, you both kind of are cut from the same cloth. And when you were having the rivalry with Punk, you kind of let him know that. It's like, yo, this guy's not like us. He wants to ruin this entire industry and put it in his honor and mess up the great thing that we sort of built. So talk to me about your relationship with Seth Rollins. I mean, you, you had a match at WrestleMania. Obviously, it was great, and then it wasn't great to have the words, but before all that, uh, your careers have been on a similar parallel sort of path, especially in the last like three or four years. So talk to me about your relationship with Seth Rollins and how that sort of grown as rivals and as co-workers. I mean, personally, it can get a little bit tense at times, uh, but as I said on TV to his face, and I mean it, you know, our rivalry is based, um, you know, in a professional setting. We just both want to be the best. We believe we are the best. And um, the iron sharpens iron. We get together, we push each other to have the best match possible, the best interview possible, whatever the situation is. And sometimes I can push those buttons a little hard, especially socially, but I love when I get people upset and I piss people off, that's when I get the best results out of people because I know I operate the best when I'm angry and Seth's pretty easy to press those buttons and when he gets angry, that's when he's at his absolute best. So I'm willing to push those buttons to get the best result for the fans, but he is one of the best in the world, one of the best I've ever been in the ring with, uh, one of my top rivals and a genuine professional wrestler. You say he's one of the best you've been in the ring with. Uh, in the not too distant past, you've had some incredible opponents. Uh, you mentioned Sheamus, of course there's Gunther, CM Punk who you wrestled recently. Two, two questions. One, do you have a favorite opponent? And two, maybe it's the same answer, but do you have a favorite match? That if you had to just show somebody who you were, what match would you show them? I mean, there's a lot of matches. Uh, I don't know what I would go to first. If I had to show somebody something, generally, you know, I love, you know, I mentioned Seth already, you know, Roman and I um, have such great, great chemistry. He's my crib tonight, I guess. I still haven't beat him after all these years. I'm still working on that one. If I had to go with somebody to show a new WWE fan, it'd probably be Sheamus just because of the, the level of physicality we bring to the matches. Um, like I'm not joking when I say I've been in no fight at a bar, a real fight I've ever been in my life comes close to what Sheamus and I do to each other in a professional wrestling match when it comes to the violence and physicality. Like we're buddies, we go way back. I always make the joke, which is not really a joke. We met when I was 19 and he was 43 at the time. Um, you know, we've always had a big brother, little brother relationship, signed to WWE the same day, went through the ups and downs of our careers and lives together, but when we get in there, it's, okay, there's a dad out there perhaps, he's got his family here, he's paid a lot of money, he's a preconception about our industry, but after our match, he's going to question what he thinks, he's going to go tell the guys at the water cooler or work, my God, whatever you think about wrestling, I saw Drew and Sheamus wrestling last night, they were hitting each other, and they were hitting each other, and marks were appearing, and blood was appearing, and then they're going to tell somebody, and suddenly we've got some new fans, and that's how we operate. We batter each other, and we have drinks together, and we've got thick skin, and we have a laugh, and that's how this industry should be, that's how life should be, is just enjoy it, have the laugh, and then just, I mean, if you're punk, you're not going to have some drinks. Have some drinks, have yourself a laugh, because none of us get out alive. Life's short, so just have fun when you're at it. We've been talking to a lot of the WWE stars that have come here and uh, obviously Fanatics Fest is incredible representing sports and entertainment all over the world but make no mistake about it, WWE is booming right now like I don't think it's ever been as popping as it is right now and there's a lot of things that people equate that to but I think one thing people aren't really talking about is the time in the pandemic when everything shut down, when everything went 
down the tubes, nothing was on TV. WWE was there, and you were its champion. And a lot of your gripes leading into WrestleMania was not being able to win in front of this crowd. And granted, I still know you want to do that, but is there anything, you, is there any solace you can take in being the world champion in the most pivotal time in, in entertainment when nothing was going on, and especially this being the catalyst to the boom period we see right now? Yeah, and we're selling out like absolutely all over the place, all over the world. It is such an exciting time. I can't believe how hot wrestling is. I can't walk down the street anymore without somebody, you know, recognizing me from wrestling and not just, hey, you're a football player or something? It's always, oh, you're Drew McIntyre from WWE. It just shows just how big we've gotten now. And it's just gonna keep getting bigger. It's wild. Like once this Netflix takes up, believe the Oh yeah, Rhea and I are kind of fighting it out. If anybody's watching, uh, you know, the boys, uh, the butcher is kind of easing the C-word into American culture. It's very, very harsh over here. It's actually a term of endearment in Scotland and a term of endearment in Australia. So Ray and I are fighting out who gets to say it first. <laughs> so, hey, listen. Maybe say it together as a cold open. Yeah, yeah, maybe, maybe, you know, maybe you'll, you'll, share, you'll share the heat. You'll share the heat if that happens. And yet, you said what ha you had your moment at WrestleMania this year, and what happened, happened. One thing you hear a lot when you talk to wrestling fans is, after the pandemic, after your title reign, you deserve a run with the title in front of the crowds. And, you know, at defending at WrestleMania, how, well, you can feel free to applaud. How, how meaningful is that idea to you? How meaningful would it be to, to have a real run as champion for an extended period of time? I mean, it's going to happen, uh, and I appreciate all the fans, especially my fans, have stuck with me uh, through this entire journey to say you deserve it, or perhaps more appropriately, you've earned it. But um, in our industry, unfortunately, you don't just get the participation prizes. It's all about timing and what makes the most sense story-wise. There's been a couple of times where I've went, clearly this makes the most sense. Why am I not winning on this moment, on this night? for this title, but then I also think about where I am now, and if I want those titles or had those moments that I thought I clearly should be having this moment on this night, then the story we're in right now wouldn't be the same, it wouldn't make as much sense, and um, yeah, everything happens for a reason. Uh, I used to hear all the time, trust the process, and sometimes when you're in the crap part, you're like, screw the process, it's BS, but truly now, like we are long-term storytellers, it is 52 weeks a year. We're finally taking the time to treat it the way it should always have been treated. Developing these deep layered characters because we have plenty of time to do it. Deep layered storylines involving multiple people. Like you look at any other TV show, they've got 10, 12 episodes, whatever, to develop these characters. You get so invested. We have unlimited time and finally we're taking that time. And I would say if I got the title before now, Perhaps it wouldn't have been as an interesting story, but eventually I have to get that freaking title and I will get that title and it's gonna mean the world because I'm basically on the campaign trail it feels like right now as much as people are behind me and sometimes I'll face somebody that they like, like a Jey Uso or a, you know, a Paul or Seth and then I have to kind of fight my case about why I feel the way I feel that I kind of win some people back over but my true fans stay with me no matter what they understand no matter what, they look at the facts no matter what and that's why you've got to watch our show closely because then you'll understand the story and the minor details to the story. All the big details, when Jey Uso showed up, the reason I acted the way I acted was simple trauma, PTSD, his family had ruined my life. They're like, come on, Drew, just get over it. To get over it. I'd imagine the UK were Roman Reigns, where I was gonna win the title, finally, after all these years, these ups and downs, my family are all there in the UK, I'm gonna present my dad the title, I'm sorry I wasn't there, I'm sorry I missed all these family events, birthdays, Christmases, wasn't there for sicknesses, deaths, this is gonna be our moment. And Jay wasn't there on the night because I took them out in the elder sense solo, but if you're guilty of a thousand crimes, you're not there on the one night because I took you out. Does that make you innocent? I'm like, but Drew, he does the eat thing and he says weird words and we like him and he's kind of cool, just forgive him. So that's how trauma and PTSD works. And it, see, it's fun to do, but it doesn't take away the PTSD. I'm suffering over here so you gotta understand my side as well. And it's 
and how we act as people. And sometimes I may overreact, but then I remind people if they did this to your family, a certain person treated you this way when you were younger, like a CM Punk. Uh, movies, something that you want to continue to pursue as you continue this incredible WWE career? I mean, it's not something I really thought much about. Like, I've always just wanted to wrestle and hopefully be fortunate enough to do it as long as possible to kind of secure retirement where I was able to say I made my money since I was 15 just wrestling but the opportunity came up to be part of Dave's movie uh, The Killer's Game which is coming out in September by the way it's coming out next month it's bizarre to see myself on a poster in the movie theaters and uh, now and Dave called me himself and he basically told me the premise of the movie. You know, it's very John Wick-like, but more, you know, comedic elements um, involved. And um, all the, the hit men and hit women in it are just unbelievable. Dave is a hit on himself. He believes, um, you know, he's got turned people. And they were looking for a character, a couple of Scottish brothers. J.J. Uh, Perry, the director, had this vision. And he said to Dave, like, I have one. I just need somebody that's, you know, big enough and imposing enough that he can beat you up. Um, you know, he kind of looks 